Imagine a place between shadow and substance, a place where the world is just thin. Not many pass through here, they just tend to get burnt up, infected. You see, knowledge is corrosive, like a, an acid. The mind can unwrap, so you're gonna wanna keep your wits about you. You gotta feel grit and patience. They say the secret of the finder. Sometimes that's true. You better hope better that's hope true. true. Welcome to the world of extraordinary beliefs. McMinnville. Yes, yes. I haven't uh, outlived my welcome here. Thank you again for having me. Uh, guys, what an incredible, really exciting weekend, just as a fan, and I'm very excited. Bob Lazar is here. <laughs> we did it, man. We flipped the script. Thanks to Bob for deciding to tell you his story again. We will have a live Q&A. There are specific things we'll go over that you haven't heard before. We're gonna get very specific today. But write really thoughtful questions. You know, not manifestos. Right. Questions, right? <laughs> yes, questions. And then we'll do our best to, to answer them. Enjoy the film. We'll be right up here on stage after, and thank you guys. This story is extraordinary, especially if it's true. And it all started in the desert. <laughs> Is north of Las Vegas. A local scientist who's worked at Groom Lake said to be where top secret weapon systems have been tested over the years. He has asked that his identity be shielded. Exactly what's going on up there? What's going on up there could be the most important event in history. Physical contact and proof of, uh, from another, another system, another planet, another intelligence. What would happen to you if the government learned that you were giving us this information? He just wanted to stay alive. Maybe this has been kept from us for a good reason. Sir, how do we know you are who you say you are? My name's Bob Lazar. I'm known for working at a classified base and reverse engineered alien spacecraft. It went all over the world. He put Area 51 on the map. Can we ever be made whole if we're not believed? what was going on in his background. I have no motivation to lie. The science and the technology can change us. We've always looked to the skies for answers instead of looking into ourselves. Thank you, Bob, for letting me make the movie. This story spans, as you know, 30 years. So thanks for watching the movie. Let's jump directly into it. It's been said by George many times that Bob Lazar is a reluctant UFO messiah. I want to hear, when you were going to be put on the news and you were nervous about your well-being, how George Knapp had the tape and you said, OK, let's do it. And the second he's putting in that tape, there was a wrestling match. You did not want your name and face out there. So each of you, I want to hear your side on stage before we start. The agreement was that we could film all of this back in the 80s. And that at any time, if I change my mind, George guaranteed me, we'll just pull it, that's it, there's no problem. So we did film all of it. and. Things started to get tense, and I began to get worried as time went on, and it finally came to the day where it was going to be aired on the 5 o'clock news, if I recall. And, you know, kind of near the last minute, but not the last minute, you know, I decided, you know what, let's not do it. I'm not going to go public with this. And uh, <laughs> George just said, no, we're doing it. <laughs> and. Uh, <laughs> So I tried to grab the tape from George, and uh, uh, I think that that's about all I remember. I don't know where it went after that. Well, I wouldn't call it a wrestling match. It was more of a tussle, and I won. Um, yeah. uh, but just context of that is that uh, 30 years ago this week, 
this Wednesday marked 30 years since the Dennis interview, the anonymous interview, and it's the synchronicity of it with the anniversary for this uh, festival and the 30th anniversary of that event that changed our lives and the, the life of Area 51 itself is amazing. It's almost like it's scripted, but uh, we did that interview with, with Bob as Dennis. I had not met him. It was a last minute thing, you know. It was somebody had canceled. I'd been hearing about Bob from John Lear for a long time. Somebody had canceled for our five o'clock news and we um, said, called Lear, hey, can your flying saucer guy, that Area 51 guy, can he do an interview? I had no idea what was going on in Bob's life at the time that he'd ran into some trouble with his employers and was afraid for his life and was surprised when they said yes. We put the five o'clock interview on this story comes spilling out. All of our jaws were dropping. The general manager comes running in. Is that real? The news director calls me in. Is that for real? The phone's ringing off the hook. All hell's breaking loose. We don't know if it was real, but we decided to find out. And so the next weekend, we go to Lear's house to meet Lazar. My news director and I, Bob, we're going to put him through his paces. We're going to ask him a bunch of questions about his background, figure out if we believe his story. And we left that meeting going, holy crap. This sounds like it's true. And if it is, it's the biggest story we're ever gonna cover. It was also the riskiest story we were ever gonna cover because our reputations were on the line individually as journalists. We could be ridiculed, it could damage the reputation of the station, so we're gonna take our time and check this out. I had to talk Bob, it took me another month to talk Bob into getting a safety interview, going on camera, not to be aired, just to have it in case something happened to him, because there was a lot of strange stuff going on at the time. Yeah, there was. Threats that were being made to him, we were all being followed around, our phones were tapped, it was a very tense time, and it's hard to convey to people uh, 30 years later how real it was, but it was real, we lived through it, it was going on. So we had that first interview, that was our safety interview, and I promised I wouldn't air it, that was just in case Bob got bumped off or something. Uh, and also, as a measure of protection, to let people know that we've already got the interview, you don't need to kill him anymore, we're still gonna tell this story. And then we did another interview in November for this series. And I remember Bob Stodall and I working, walking out of the meeting with, with uh, Bob and saying, gosh, we could do a multi-part series. This could be like five parts or something. We end up doing two weeks. Each of the stories were, you know, a typical news story, even in those days, was a minute and a half, two minutes. These stories were 12, 13, 14 minutes long. And it was the biggest, highest rated thing that's ever been on television in Las Vegas. So, more context. We ended up doing a two-week series. Part six is where we're gonna reveal the identity of Bob. So we're five parts into it, setting it up. History of Area 51 and ufology and all that stuff. We've already teased it over the weekend. Monday's the day we're gonna release the identity of this mysterious Dennis character, and the whole world was trying to figure out who he was. And that was the day that Bob's in the station and uh, trying to grab the tape, I've changed my mind. I said, no, sorry. <laughs> we're, too, we're too late into it. I mean, literally, we were editing right up to the last minute, and I am taking the tape down to the edit bay, and I'm gonna run out to this studio. And we started tussling for the tape and wrestled a little bit, and I said, no, it's too late. We're too late into it, and ran down the hallway, stuck the tape in the machine, and then I went out on set, and history was made. So. <laughs> that was There's a lot I want to cover today based on your questions, so let's rapid fire go through them. Bob, do you feel that this movie accurately tells your story? Yeah, it really does. Um, I mean, I had a chance to kind of go through it, and uh, Jeremy assured me, unlike George, that it, it, <laughs> at any point, you know, uh, if there's something that well, I said wasn't accurate, I just said it had to be factually accurate. Um, it didn't matter if I liked something or not, uh, it just as long as it was, was true. But yeah, yeah, there was, it certainly told the story up to that part. I mean, there's a whole lot it didn't say, uh, but that's way too much to fit into an hour and a half. And you know, there's like two hours of bonus materials and I'm still releasing footage to clarify certain points, but just to be very clear, Bob gave me absolute access to his life, was able to interview his mom, you know, his friends that all went through this. A lot of people that didn't go on camera couldn't go on camera on behalf of Bob because of whatever reasons they had. So a lot of the information, I, I gave you everything I could in the movie. The only restriction, because as I'm looking this, you know, I'm looking 
I, to be honest, you got to look for holes. I'm looking at Bob. I'm looking at his story, and he gave me complete access to his archives of tapes. Go ahead and take them. Documents, cell phone, who do you want to call? He was helpful in every way he could for me to help clarify his story. The only thing he said was, do not twist it more. It's got to be accurate. That's it. And so hopefully we achieved that, and you got a taste of that, and there's a lot more coming through the bonus materials. Okay. This is interesting one because we have um, Commander Fravor in the audience who I'm real excited to speak with soon. I'm grateful that you're here, Commander. Uh, Bob, do you have any thoughts on the recently revealed UFO uh, videos and program detailed by the New York Times? So meaning the Tic Tac and Gimbal. The Tic Tac and Gimbal, yeah, seeing okay. those craft. Do you have any thoughts about your experiences and, and now the acknowledgement of a reverse engineering program, the attempt to reverse engineer a propulsion system as far as how they're looking at it? But more importantly, the Gimbal and the Tic Tac, the movements of those, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, very much so. I mean, they, they move, they behave. I mean, they act exactly like a gravity-propelled craft would. It's, to me, it's a very vindicating thing. And speaking to Commander Fravor and you know, looking at the tape, and you can see the way uh, you know, a craft move, as he uh, mentioned, the way it moves like a ping pong ball in a cup and bouncing around, something that doesn't have inertia. I mean, propulsion like this is not possible with our technology and probably won't be for a very long time. But uh, yeah, these crafts seem to operate exactly like the craft that I worked on. So it was, uh, I, f I find that really fascinating. I'm, I'm anxious to talk to him some more about exactly what he saw. Yeah, people are making that connection now because look, in 1989, George Knapp broke the story with Bob. Government program attempting to reverse engineer UFOs. Remember, we had been told in 1969 that all ended. That is proven to be a lie by the Pentagon now by their own admission. And thanks, George, for proving those videos were real through the right process. So now, through the lens of 30 years, not only the reports of how these things move and the videos of how they move, but we're living in an era where we now know the study of UFOs has been and is currently live and strong. So we have to account for that when we look at what Bob has told you. Again, Bob is just telling you his story. Take it or leave it. It's better for him if you leave it because his life and his wife is great and he doesn't need more interruption. But I, he thought it was important enough to untwist the knots over the years that have been twisted. So that's what you get, hopefully, in the movie. Okay. Okay, w this is interesting. What, some, some of these little obscure questions that Bob didn't cover in the film. What is the history of the alien-human interactions according to the briefing documents that you were able to read when you were there? What is the history of the kind of human-alien thing? Like, what did they tell you? about the ETs. They didn't tell me anything. I have to make a very big distinction between the information and technology I had hands on and could verify and you know, analyze and briefings that I read that had to do with other facets of the project, which I can't, I can't say if they were real. I don't know why they would be. Other information I read in the briefings was accurate. So, but there was some information from other groups. Everything was split into so many different groups. That some dealt with metallurgy, some dealt with you know, the origin of the craft, and uh, information was so compartmentalized we couldn't talk to the other groups, which is a really ridiculous way to have science move forward. You have to have communication. So uh, the way the military handles stuff, it just doesn't work with research. But they were so concerned about, you know, somebody getting more information than they need, uh, they kept everything separate. But in any case, they alluded to the fact that there was, there was some alien-human interaction at some point. But um, that they had been involved with us for a long time. That's the allegation. In yeah, it went back. It went back very far. The craft had been here for like ten thousand years or something like that. Right, you had mentioned before kind of new, new information that uh, you, they, were, they gave you the impression that the craft that you worked on and the other ones were from some sort of archaeological... I, that's the, the impression I had. It was from more of an archaeological, 
archaeological dig. It wasn't like the aliens landed and said, here's one of our craft. It, uh, you know, I think it's just something, I don't know how we came across it, um, but we did, but they were, they were very old. I want to get into these specifics that for 30 years people have asked, and Bob has explained to me, but he just haven't explained to you, so let's get into these little details. You mentioned in the documentary that you have dismantled devices from another civilization. What fasteners, methods, are used to hold it together? Screws, clips, whatever. Can you tell us about yeah, that? Yeah, this is something that fascinates me. I mean, back in, back in the 80s, there was no 3D printing, so it was... It was a complete mystery how this stuff was put together. The craft itself, there is not one single right angle anywhere in any part of it. Every single thing has a radius of curvature to it. And I think in the 80s, I said when talking with George, it's as if somebody made a big model out of wax and then heated it just a little bit so it all melted and then let it cool. And that's the way everything looked. It had a everything had a smooth interconnecting look to it. There were no fasteners anywhere. There were no seams anywhere. And uh, you know, nowadays you think, well, if they had some gigantic 3D printer, I guess uh, you know, using alien technology, they could make it that way. But I didn't even think of that back then. It was just a mystery how it was. But I mean, was, what was even more so of a mystery is that there's no wiring anywhere. You know, the com subcomponents from you know, a reactor that trem generates tremendous amounts of power and the other subcomponents, the amplifiers and the emitters, there's nothing connecting them. And when you remove them and move them away, they still work. It's, it's unreal. I mean, it is absolute borderline magic. So it's, it's nothing that we're going to, you know, duplicate and we're going to add this to an F-16 or something. It's, it's going to be a long time before we know what the hell's going on. So George has said to me from the very beginning, look, if people don't want to believe Bob, they're going to find a thousand ways to discredit him because that's, they don't want to believe you, so go ahead. However, you're, if you deny the evidence that we have, then you're missing the picture. And some of the greatest skeptics online you know, tend to fixate on these little things. And one question that's been like looming for 30 years, and Bob and I talked about it for like a minute, and people are asking, well, how did you turn the reactor off, Bob? If, you, if the reactor's on and you're putting your hands to it, and there's a gravitational field, right, and you can't put your hands, how did you turn it on or off? And that seems to be one of the things, like, the people that want to just not believe just bring up. It's not even in, like, a nice way, just asking a question. So publicly, just how did you turn the reactor on or off, Bob? Are they implying that it, it can't be turned off? or Yes, I mean, the implication okay. is with a gravity field as described... Oh, for so some you reason can't reach it. Okay, that's, that's not how you turn the reactor off. You don't touch the reactor. I mean, there, there are actually a lot of ways to do that, but the way we most commonly turned it off is if you take one of the emitters and rotate it. I don't know what the angle is. I think it was like 80 degrees or something, but if you rotate it, it the reactor shuts down. So... The, it, it's kind of a load sensing reactor and rotating the uh, emitter to that angle, that magical angle, whatever it was, um, that's like a null position. The reactor shuts down and that's how we turn it on and off. But I mean, there's, there's not an on off switch. Everything is very fluid and operates when you really don't think it will. Yeah, so um, how has your life or business <laughs> <laughs> How has your life or business changed since the release of the movie, Be besides the raid, Bob? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the, the raid was not a good Okay, time. let's think about the good stuff. How has your life or business changed since the release of the movie, or has it? Um, not a lot. You know, it's a very specialized business. We sell scientific equipment and, you know, radioactive isotopes and chemicals. It's not like the average person goes, I need some strontium-90. And, you know, <laughs> they're not going to... So it really, it's not an increase in business, although you gave me some of the extra movie posters you had, and we put them on the website, so we sold some of the posters, but I mean... <laughs> By the way, Bob's having a sale on Strontium 90 this yeah, week. Right. <laughs> it's so, so, um, no, really, it, it, it hasn't affected it at all. I mean, that's Not good. to any big degree, I should say. The effect that, that I have seen is that uh, now in light of what is known publicly around the world about UFOs and about the projects, 
that people are now not with their pitchforks in the audience. They, they want to hear, okay, maybe he is telling us the truth. They want to hear what you have to say, and I think that's the biggest change. Um, you know, Bob is not uh, profiteering off of my film. He wants me to succeed as a filmmaker. He just wanted me to tell his story accurately. I just want to make that clear because, you know, the hardest thing that I see is that people try to uh, vilify or um, try to attack the, the messenger to dismiss the message, and, and that's what I've seen, and I think it's ridiculous, but here we go. Um, next one, small stature aside, why else do you think they might have uh, been called the kids? Remember, they called, they never said aliens, they said... The oh, they always said the kids, yeah. Yeah, yeah, so, so why do you think they called them the kids? That's just conjecture. I mean, at the, it, it says small stature aside, but that's the only thing I would grab onto was just because they were little creatures, obviously. But um, I don't know. I really don't know. Uh, do you think that you were part of some sort of covert operation unbeknownst to you at the time? So you know how people say you were there, they showed you like a movie set, they faked stuff. You know, do you think you were part of a covert? No. no. Okay, so, so how do you know? How do you know that what they showed you wasn't faked? And uh, it's important for people to hear. Well. First of all, the stuff that I had hands-on experience with, um, it is impossible to fake things like that. You cannot fake a force field. You cannot fake time slowing down. I mean, these things are not possible at all, and probably won't be for <laughs> hundreds of years using our technology. So that, you know, there's, there's no doubt about the technology I was involved in was way, way beyond what humans are capable of at this point. Um, the way the craft was assembled, like I said, you know, the huge amounts of power moving around without interconnections, and I mean, this is beyond what Tesla would have ever dreamed of. Uh, again, these things are not possible. So, yeah, a movie set, that's ridiculous. Bob has always made that distinction to me. I was like, how do you know the difference between, you know, the documents and he goes, what I had hands on is what I can tell you about. You just said two things I want you to clarify. Force field and time, just slowing down time or stopping time, time dilation. Explain okay. those. The force field, when we had the reactor fired up, it was one of the things that Barry, my coworker, showed me. And I think I mentioned that in the movie. You put your, he said, put your, try to put your hand on the sphere at the top, and you couldn't. It just pushed back. It was like two like poles of a very large magnet and you know without having a metal hand it was uh, it was an amazing feeling I mean I was I was really excited at that point I said oh my god it's a force field I mean this is this is awesome um, and jumping over to the other question the time dilation when we had the reactor and the uh, amplifier and emitter set up in the on the test bench we did a couple experiments, and one of them was how uh, we could get a watch to run uh, at different speeds in the gravitational field. So we actually saw time dilation, so it was really fascinating. One of the things I had mentioned a long time ago to George, he lit a candle, and you can see the flame stop flickering, but it still emitted light which it kind of shouldn't have. So, I mean, there are lots of indications that some of our physics wasn't complete in explaining what was going on. So that's why some of the stuff is so important that it be released to the public. But I just, I don't know <laughs> what's happened to this information or the technology since I left the project. You know, Bob and I had discussed many times over the years, um, could this be disinformation of some sort? Were you shown something and they assume that eventually you'd spill the beans and it serves as a diversion or cover story for something else that's going on out there, that they wanted to divert attention away from something else that was being tested at Groom Lake. That was the first round of disinformation accusations sent our way. What would be more I know. classified what, than that? Yeah, what would be more <laughs> classified than flying saucers? That's the first. But the other thing is, if somebody did have an idea in mind that we're going to put out this flying saucer story, then we're not going to crush him and crush his credibility and we'll distract attention from something else out there. That was kind of a miserable failure because as a result of Bob's story, every media organization in the world beat a path to Area 51's door. 
tens of thousands of people uh, have gone out there with binoculars looking in the sky for whatever it is that's uh, flying out there. Area 51 is a really legitimate national security site. The men and women who toil in obscurity out there have helped us win the Cold War. They protected our country. They do great and important work. And they don't, I mean, this is not a good thing to have so much attention focused on that facility. It's still important. They still do important work. So if somebody came up with a plan, let's put out a flying saucer story to divert attention away from the X project. Man, they, they got sent to, to Alaska or something and, because that was a really bad idea. And, and again, Bob has always made a distinction between the technology that he had hands on and the stuff that he read, because some of that is pretty wild stuff. And it fed into narratives that were floating around in the UFO world at the time. We've met secret treaties with aliens, and we've given them permission to abduct people, and they've genetically engineered us. He doesn't know if that's true, and he doesn't know exactly why he was shown that information. And we've discussed it a bunch of times. You know, it's possible that maybe that was... Uh, an added little bonus that they put in there to, to fly it up the flagpole and see what happens. But big secrets can be kept. Big secrets are kept. That was one of the arguments uh, about us tackling this series back then, is that nothing this big could be kept secret. Well, we'll ask Commander Faber about that later today, whether big secrets can be kept, um, because they can be. You know, 1969 Project Blue Book ended. We didn't know until December 2017, or at least the public didn't know, uh, that they had an ongoing st UFO study, that it was going on, that millions of dollars were being spent, that a lot of people were working on it. And we've learned since that there are other classified projects along these same lines that we still don't know the names of, and we don't know who's involved and what their focus is. So secrets can and are kept. So I want to keep with your questions to honor the fact that you wrote them. I can't get through all of them, but I, I do want to bring something up right now. The raid, the FBI raid. There's recently released agency assist reports and I, I just want to tell you my experience. So I make this film. People accused me of fabricating the raid to dramatize my movie. I made it up. I dealt with that for months. They said Bob's wife, Joy, was the, was the FBI agent that you saw the photo of the back of. I mean, just crazy stuff. So there I am one day defending that I'm a documentary filmmaker. I'm just, I don't need to share it with you. I'm trying to document and share with you what I'm experiencing and seeing. So there I am defending that. Next day, a friend of mine, he was able, hours before us, to get a local agency assist report. We were unable to get the FBI report. Bob said, there was a uh, warrant. He goes, I saw it upside down, but you know, they didn't hand it to me. And we're thinking, well, we can't find it. So we get this agency assist report. And then like the next day, I'm defending something else. People are saying, oh, now it's prosaic. It's just prosaic why there was so much law enforcement, multiple agency, wasn't the first time, Bob, that uh, people came to, to Bob's place of business. And I said, we were surveilled. We have our own reasons to understand that. The report comes out. I thought, there you go. It proves what I said in my documentary. It proves the scope, the scale, the forensic truck, the surveillance. And I'm like, oh, now I can relax on Twitter. Not the case. It is my belief, and Bob's, and George's, that they were there for 115. And we have very specific reasons that I can't prove yet to you, but we have specific reasons to believe that's the case. I want to hear from Bob. What was the experience? I want to hear your personal experience. It was swarmed with over 24 individuals, from what I count. But two came up to you at a door. Two came up to you with something in their hand. They were coming in anyway. Were they looking with hazmat teams? No, there's okay. no hazmat teams. Okay, so tell us, tell us your experience, though, on this, and I'll clarify later. No, when they first came in, they gave me the cover story. And, yeah, the place had 24 or so agents in there. It was shoulder to shoulder. You had to kind of move around. There were so many people in there, and, uh, which already struck me as being weird. I said, if you guys are just looking for receipts, what are, why did you bring everyone here? And uh, some of the other underlings they brought with them just gave me some paperwork. They said, yeah, we're looking for you know, thallium metal. And I said, oh, okay, I'll get it. Gave them a little vial here of thallium metal. And I said, is this what you guys have? They said, no, we're just, you can put that away. So I went, okay. These guys are starting to section off the building into cubic meters. I went, holy cow, what are you doing? 
They had everybody else working down below, and then they took me upstairs. We went up there, then they had the guys jump on the computers and try to suck everything off of those, and that's when they played me your, you know, our conversation, which was we, what we were talking about is where the 115 was hidden. I want to get a little more specific about that. The experience, though, they, they said, hey, Bob, they showed up behind you, two people, and, and they have an upside-down, obvious warrant from FBI, and they're like, you know, we have a couple of people coming, can we come in? So you're allowing in two people. And then all of a sudden, there's about 24 forensic collection agents, truck, multiple agencies. The report, the agency assist reports, proves this. It also says that there was a hazmat team, you know, and the whole suits hazmat, and they cleared the place to no, make sure. That, that didn't happen. That didn't happen. Right. So I talked with Zach about that too, because in the film he he just said hazmat because that was he just told me out that you know that's the word that came to his mind. He goes, but it, it wasn't like that. From what my account that I've heard from you and Zach, they appeared disinterested with this basic idea of toxic materials. The whole thing was they wanted to talk to you upstairs. Is that correct? Yeah, right. that's, that's correct. They wanted to talk to me and the other guys, all they wanted was a couple of sheets of paper. So they did say to you out the door, we're looking for receipts and an order form from a client of yours. That's what they told you when they were walking Yeah, this is door. something that happened like two years ago. You right, know, we the, had already been over all this, so it was clearly just a, a cover story to come back in and have access to the property. Which is, which is our opinion based upon our experiences, but I just wanted you to hear from Bob. The agency assist report, it's very odd, it's very detailed, and not only that, Bob's experience of what happened doesn't jive with what you're reading in that agency assist report in a lot of ways. No, it's, a lot of that is not, is not true. We are convinced beyond a shadow of a doubt that our conversation was taken in the woods at his property oh, yeah. the, mm -hmm. the day before. But I just wanted you to hear from Bob his personal experience of that moment. Because every turn we make, you know, there's people that just, they'll never believe and they look for anything to dismiss it. Or almost worse, they just believe without thinking. So, well, right. either way, they're welcome to dismiss it and then they ask me less questions and that's fine. Okay. Back to, back to some details from the audience. Have you ever looked at S4 from a satellite image? Could you identify it? Great question about S4. Like, could you see it from a satellite image? Have you ever looked for it on satellite? Yeah, a lot of times. Um, and I do like to make that distinction. It is not Area 51. It is S4. Area 51 is to the north, although a lot of people relate them together. They say S4 is part of the Area 51 complex, but that, even that gets into some technicalities there. Because people say, oh, I know somebody that worked up at Area 51. There's no flying saucers or anything like that up there. And I, they're right. There, there isn't. Um, it's down at S4. There's only 22 people when I worked there. And um, as far as seeing it from the air, yeah, I've, I've seen it many times. There's uh, a lot of people have sent me emails where they, they think they see the hangar doors at the right angle. And yeah, you can see it on Google Earth. It's, it's not obvious, but you can see the road that I drove to down from Area 51. That's where I flew into and took the bus down. And uh, yeah, I can point it right out to you. In fact, uh, you, your buddy John Ferrat, uh hired some time on a Russian satellite to take a photo of an exact time that you said right. take a photo of Papoose Lake. The and Americans wouldn't let him do it, so he went to Russia, and they did, yeah. And he's, and he's got the original uh, negative, and on that negative is a very, and they posted it back in the day, is a, is a circular metallic object hovering right over the mountain range of Papoose. Have you guys seen that? The, it's, it's a poster. They made it into a poster. Yeah, it's, it's great. I mean, they, he hit it right on the nose. It was awesome. Right when Bob told them they should shoot that shot from a satellite from Russia. Um, George Knapp has said to me before, uh, we've, and this is something that project I think we're going to do together, we've learned more about the U.S. UFO programs from Russia than we have from the U.S. And I think that's specifically because George took a trip during Glasnost and Perestroika and came out with some documents from the UFO program in Russia, which the world has yet to truly be able to see. And I think we're gonna, coming up soon. Next project, George? 
over my dead body. <laughs> no, yes. Yeah, we'll do that project sometime. Yeah. Uh, it, he's not exaggerating. I went, went to Russia. I had a unique opportunity in the early 90s when the, you know, they were trying to open up to the world. They were experimenting with uh, capitalism and democracy, glasnost, perestroika. I read in the New York Times that the KGB had opened up the Lee Harvey Oswald file, and I thought, this might be the time to go and see if we could get uh, UFO files. So we did. We worked on it. Uh, we had a Russian physicist who had been a national security advisor to the Russian parliament and to Boris Yeltsin, and we sent him. He had been in the United States uh, lecturing on nuclear disarmament at our national laboratories. Had nothing to do when he went back, so we hired him, a company I was working for, and, and set him up and said, go find people who were in a position to know about the Russian UFO studies who have never spoken to journalists, Western or otherwise, and let us know. And it took him eight months, and he set it up, and I went in 93 to Russia, and I met a guy named Colonel Boris Sokolov, Ministry of Defense, who had been in charge of this Russian program. It was the largest UFO study probably in, in history. And for 10 years, the every unit in the vast Soviet military empire at the time was ordered to every anomalous aircraft or ball of light or UFO or strange object in the sky. When you get those reports from military personnel, fully investigate it, get pictures, get witness statements, put it all together and send it to one central location, and they did. And we were able to acquire a lot of that information and interview Colonel Sokolov, and basically he said, they were doing the same thing we're trying to do. He said, we're, we know that these craft have capabilities beyond anything that we've got. And we wanted to study this to figure it out so we could gain an advantage over the US in terms of stealth capabilities. We wanted to figure out the technology, which as it turns out is the same thing we've been doing, you know, trying to figure it out. Mm -hmm. To be continued. Yeah. Bob. Back in 1989, when you were terrified, and I just released a new video on my YouTube talking about that time when you were scared, you took friends, multiple groups, three Wednesdays in a row. You said, guys, things are really complicated for me. It's one thing to tell you. It's another thing to show you. There's this little place called Papoose Lake. It's, it's not Area 51. It's south of there, this obscure mountain range. There's a test flight. And I know when it happens, and I'm going, to sh I'm going to show you. And you brought friends out there, and you showed them those test flights as proof to your friends because you said to me, it's one thing telling someone, it's another thing showing right. someone. Right. Well, working there, I had the test flight schedule. So that's when I took, it was, I mean, the majority of my friends at that time. We went out there, and, um, you know, the craft came up, you know, over the mountain range at the, at the time I indicated, and, uh, you know, Clearly, everybody was amazed. We watched it, uh, you know, do some amazing maneuvers. Since we got away with it, you know, we did it a couple more times, you know, and right up until we got caught. So, you know. And uh, George and I have talked with, I think, everybody now that was in those uh, sightings, and they don't agree on most things in life. They do agree on one thing, that uh, Bob was right. He took him out there, and what he showed them, they had never seen anything before like that or since. So they also filmed it. And there, there's a, it's an old 80s camera, not like our iPhones, but even iPhones, you point it at dark, you get a, a light. However, there's a gentleman in the audience that did some incredible analysis of Bob's original footage of the flying saucer coming up over Papoose Lake. With the new software and analytics that he did, it, it's, it's pretty incredible. And he had a question. Why does the shape of the craft in your video change from frame to frame so radically? Are we seeing localized gravity lensing? Yeah, that's exactly what you're saying. Because remember, there's three emitters in that craft. Each emitter is producing its own gravitational field out of it. And gravity bends light. So it's just like taking a prism or cut glass ball and rotating it, and you'll see different facets of light. So the same thing happens as the craft move around and you see through one gravitational field to the next, the craft's gonna look different. So it looks like it's jumping around or flickering, and, and that's, that's exactly what you see in the video. Uh, you're probably familiar with the M drive, which is that propulsion device. Do you think this technology the EM drive? I'm sorry. It's okay. EM drive. 
Do you think this technology is close to breaking the barrier for space travel? No, it's useful, but I, I, I am not that impressed with it. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. <laughs> you know, it's the hardest thing sometimes to ask. I said, Bob, Bob, look, after all this time, you know, they've proven element 115 was fabricated. And he looked at me, he's like, yeah, uh, of course it is, German, but not the stable version I talked about. There's, you know, dozens, if not hundreds of isotopes or whatever he said. He was unimpressed with the fabrication, you know, even though they called him when they were doing the experiments at fabrication, uh, you know, a particle accelerator, he was unimpressed. The next one, I go, Bob, they just came out. Gravity is a wave. You're vindicated. It's a wave. It's, it's not just a graviton like you said. And he goes, well, Jeremy, you know, if you think about it, I had a 50-50% chance of being right. <laughs> so it's hard to impress Bob. With, he's a very skeptical dude. So I think the most pressing question I saw on all of these cards, Bob, what is your favorite pastime? <laughs> <laughs> That's actually tough to say. Um... Oh, I don't know. That's that's a stumper there. I can tell you, it's making laser beams and shooting off rockets. Come on. Yeah, I mean, probably building weird things. I guess would be a pastime. Blowing I, stuff up comes to mind. Well, I, pyrotechnics. I've been. Yeah, I've I've done pyrotechnics since I was twelve. So probably probably that or any kind of technical thing. I love building stuff. So I I tell her to say. I, I really enjoyed the making of the film because the breaks of our film were usually blowing things up or building lasers or hearing Bob, um, you know, talk on the phone to, you know, physicists from universities or government labs that are asking him about, you know, the, the atomic weight of, you know, certain isotopes, however they're explaining it, it was above my head. But just hearing you do your thing, my, my goal in my film, it was not to, to prove Bob's story. Bob said from the very beginning, I, I don't have everything to prove to you my story. That's not why I'm telling you. I'm telling you to save my own skin, and I'm also telling you because he believes you have a right to know. Take it or leave it. He, he's always been like that. Uh, however, however, the movie after 30 years, um, it's really hard to ignore some of the evidence, but most importantly, what I hope you got from my film is what I got, what I personally got. Getting to know Bob, and George told me this from day one when he challenged me in 2012 to try to get, you know, the Bigfoot of ufology, the Elvis born again on camera, the reluctant UFO messiah on camera, when George challenged me to just show you who Bob is, to humanize him, to show you his daily life, the, the big question we're all sitting here with is, he's telling you a story, is he worthy of your trust? That, well, well, no, I, but that's the question. That really is the question. If we can't prove it definitively, it's telling your story. You have to decide, is he worthy of your trust? And, and the world has changed now, and I think I would love to hear from George. We are living in a different world now. We're living in a world where we, it is now admitted there are unknown craft of unknown origin flying in our airspace with impunity and an increased frequency, and our own government is not only interested now but has been for a long time proven. So, George, can you just touch upon Bob's story and that? Well, it's a really exciting time, and things are starting to move so fast. I mean, two weeks ago, the U.S. Navy comes out with an announcement, uh, just is astonishing, to say, we're going to try to make it easier for our pilots to uh, report UFOs. These encounters are increasing. There, there are uh, dangers to aviation. There are legitimate concerns, legitimate reasons why we need to start making it easier for pilots to talk about it. That would be unthinkable uh, no. months ago. I think Commander Fravor, who we're going to hear from later today, probably had a big role in that happening, uh, in speaking to uh, people in Washington and letting them know this is going on. And the fact that these reports keep coming in, that there are a lot of them that keep coming in now, dramatic sort of encounters and, and things that are, are, are undeniable. And the fact that you know, we've, we've learned a lot about ATIP and OSAP uh, and, you know, the things that, uh, that I had been allowed to know about but couldn't report for a long time is, uh, is spilling out. There's so much more that's still to come. There's, there's so much more to still to come. And uh, I don't know how much of it and how soon, but it's coming, you know. And, and the fact that it, it's synchronized with Bob's story and coming full circle. Thirty years ago, he comes forward. And now Jeremy's film is out, and, and, and all at the same time, all these news events are happening where 
the doors are opening up a little bit. I mean, they're not wide open, but they're opening up quite a bit, and uh, it's an exciting time. I don't know if it's vindication. I never felt like we needed to be vindicated, but yeah, it kind of feels that way. It kind of feels that way. <laughs> yeah. um, so I, I want to hit a couple things, too. Uh, you know, Bob has always said to me, like in private, he goes, look, Jeremy, I, I'm explaining to you the best I understood in alien technology. I, I'm explaining to you the best it was described to me and, and what I saw. You know, I don't have all the answers. I'm sorry, but I can tell you what I saw and what I think. And uh, one of the things that was always really touching, I just want to be straight, you know, did element 115 was the known fuel source for the extraterrestrial craft that you worked on. At one time in 1989, you said that you got a piece of Element 115 out of Los Alamos where it was being machined under the code name LA-1000. You say that in my movie. You did have a piece of 115 at one time, right? <laughs> See, well, what, where are you going with this? Well, I, I'm, just, I'm just saying the, the Element 115 was the key. It, it is the thing that generates... Yeah, it's the fuel for the craft, if you want to look at it that way, yeah. And it has unique properties. Oh, absolutely. Can you explain the unique properties of Element 115 so that everybody really grasps it the way I feel it? They, I, we weren't 100% sure how it, how it worked because you just can't cut open the reactor to find out what's going on. But um, it looked like the 115 is bombarded with radiation and it, produ and it produces a stronger gravitational field. Now the rest of the equipment in the craft, the reactor, it takes that, that wave, that gravitational wave that comes off of it, it roots it throughout the craft uh, in a conduit, just like microwaves, and through the skin of the craft. It takes that and funnels it down to the amplifiers and then to the emitters. So it seems to behave a lot like microwaves do, which uh, propagate through tuned channels. But it all came back to one little triangle of 115. That was the center of the whole craft. And no, I mean, we don't know everything about it. I'm not sure I could do, if you gave me a piece of 115, I'm, I'm not sure I could do much with it. I could probably make it explode, but <laughs> I don't think I, I, I'm not sure I can make it propel anything, but um, you know, a, a lot of it was, was guesswork, too. We were just trying to do our best educated guesses to come up uh, with how this worked. And, you know, our, our number one aim was to see if we could duplicate this technology with what we had at hand. And, uh, you know, clear across the board, the answer was no all the time. So we're talking about a stabilized form of element 115. So, for example, I learned this in... It's not... St uh, well, okay, if you say I, stabilize, me, it means you take something... I mean, you're implying... Let me, cl let me okay, clarify. Right. So there's... I, I learned this from Bob, and I can hopefully translate to you. So, for example, there are 37 different isotopes for gold. One is stable. It's what's on your ring, right? Right. So, the rest are radioactive and, yeah, decay. So the versions that have been fabricated by slamming particles in a particle accelerator and getting maybe four atoms at about a million bucks a piece that last for 220 milliseconds, we're talking about one or two different isotopic combinations where there could be many, many more combinations. In fact, it's predicted by science that there's an island of stability right in that sweet spot for 115. So what you're talking about is stable physical element 115 220-something grams that was highly machined that were used in these craft. Is that correct? Yeah, that's correct. Well, you know, say you were trying to use gold as your, as your example. I mean, say you were just trying to fabricate gold, you know, just from atoms. I mean, what did you say? There were 37 isotopes or something yes, like that? Yeah. Look, you only have a 1 in 37 chance of making it. So most likely, you're going to make unstable isotope after unstable isotope until, you know, one day you fall upon the combination that is, results in a stable isotope. So, yeah, they just began playing with 115, and just the fact that they made, you know, four atoms of it on their first try, and it was unstable, you know, that, that really doesn't tell any story. You have, you've got a long way to go before you figure out every combination, and if one of them is stable. 
You, but, you'd said back then um, that you didn't think we'd ever be able to make it. It would be too expensive, take too much energy to make a stable version that it, you thought it had, had to be natural. That wherever we acquired it, it was perform, produced naturally, supernova, double star, something like that. Well, I, I stick by that when I say we can't produce it. I mean a usable quantity, four atoms, is not, not visible, not useful, it, it's nothing. I mean, to make, to make a gram of it is still impossible, even the version that they made. So, um, yeah, that's the amount of energy and time it takes. Sitting there plugging neutrons in is uh, <laughs> a time-consuming, expensive task. Uh, so you were told that there, we had a stockpile of 500 pounds of element 115. However, in your hand, or you were able to work with, about 228 grams highly machined in this triangular formation. So you physically saw... Was it 228 or was it 223? It was 220-something, I said, because I yeah, wasn't Even so I can't remember, yeah. but yeah, that's all I ever... Okay, but had. even that amount that couldn't have been made by any human technology... Oh, hell no. Not even within our supernova do we think we could, I mean, it had to come as cargo from somewhere else, is that correct? Well, I mean, you don't know. There might be advanced ways of, you know, arranging atoms and fabricating, you know, elements on a, on a gigantic scale that we haven't even conceived about. So the only way I know of is, you know, the energies required and pressures and temperatures, you know, is some, you know, gigantic natural you know, foundry like, a, you know, a neutron star or exploding supernova, something along those lines. But I don't know, look, look at the technology that these guys have. I mean, that nothing said, and since they can control gravity and they have force fields and things, I mean, they might have a machine that can crank this stuff out, you know, like we make plastic. But my point is, humans didn't Humans make, can, humans cannot, no. Did not, cannot. No, no, not at all. If humans can't fabricate this, and you were told this story, what's so interesting to me is you, the first time you go to Site 4, and by the way, Site 4, it's not toxic. You're not going to die of cancer just being there. People try to debunk Bob's story, being you can't step foot on there, too much radiation, you're going to die. I've talked to two employees of Area 51 who have gone on Papoose for extended periods of time, and they are not sick. So that's another thing people try to debunk with. Actually, one was stopped by civilian contractor eg and security, and he was a Navy guy and kind of pissed about it. And they stopped him. So if there's, no, if there's no facility there, I'm not sure why he got stopped, but I got him on record, and I will be able to release that later. One of the things about your story that I find really interesting, your account of it, Bob didn't believe this was extraterrestrial. His friends that knew him before that I have spoke with said that Bob felt bad for people that believed in UFOs. You know, they got to be crazy. Yeah, so that's, that's who he was before. The first time, and I want you to just tell us this feeling, the first time he saw the craft in the hangar, he, he ran his hand along, he wasn't supposed to touch it, and uh, he thought, wow, everybody that saw fine saucers, it was us. It was America. That's what he thought. But yeah, that, I thought that was the first time I saw it when they let me in through the hangar, I thought, oh, wow, I mean, this is the new advanced fighter we're keeping secret, and it, th this explains all those crazy UFO sightings, and, um, you know, it all made perfect sense to me <laughs> until, you know, I got in contact with everything. Until you stepped inside, walked inside, tell us how you walked inside, because people want to know that, but that feeling you described of seeing everything, the size of the seats, the feeling you had. Can you explain that to everybody like you explained to me? Yeah, um, there is a hatch on the side that extends below and above the center line. And when you go in, you pretty much have to crawl in there. They have a little stanchion to go up there. But it was obvious, I mean, immediately when you go in there, why did they make this thing so small? What the hell's going on? You couldn't stand up in the middle, and it was clearly made for something much smaller than a person. You know, it's aside from all the technology, but just the physical aspects of it, that the material, you know, was all the same, everything was the same color, the way it was assembled, everything started looking stranger and stranger to me. Um, you know, and then it became obvious once we started having discussions about what I was working on, 
that this is a reverse engineering project. You know, it, it took a while for this to hit me because I was, uh, I really didn't buy any of this UFO nonsense for a long time. So George, I wanted to ask, you know, again, through the lens of 30 years, I know neither of you expected this to transform your lives and take over like this. How has reporting and taking that risk on Bob's story, because you vetted him, you didn't just believe him, you vetted him hard. How has it changed your life over 30 years? Well, it certainly affected the arc of my professional life. Um, I, I think it probably put a cap on what I could do because uh, I would forever be the UFO guy. And, you know, I've done a lot of UFO stories over the years, starting with Bob, uh, but I've done thousands of other stories and, and uh, have got, you know, have, Matt and I have had some success in terms of uh, recognition for those stories, but it doesn't matter. Wherever I go, I'm the UFO guy. And I'm stopped in, you know, in restaurants and bars when I end up in a bar and uh, at, at men's, in men's rooms and urinals, as I told yesterday, and, uh, and in foreign countries and airports and, you know, the UFO guy and, it, and grocery stores and people want to come up and, hey, do you do really, really believe that stuff? And, you know, they don't, they don't really care what I believe about UFOs. They want to tell me their UFO story. And it's just amazing to me that everybody's got one. Uh, and you, it, everybody's got one. It's somebody in their family, they've seen something, or somebody else in their family, or their grandma has a story, or something landed in the backyard or out on the farm. Uh, it's amazing how far it reaches. So it, it has changed, changed me in a lot of ways in that uh, I was not really that interested in it, you know, until I started working on this. And, and then it, it's uh, captured my attention ever since. It's, uh, I don't work on UFO stuff all the time, but I think about it all the time. So I would add just one other thing in that skepticism in this topic is important. It's important for you to be skeptical and ask questions, but skepticism in the sense of, hey, I, I wanna know more, I wanna learn more, I wanna ask questions, I wanna be an I have those questions answered. That's fine, you, it, you need it in here because there's so much crazy stuff in the UFO world. It's right to ask questions of Bob and, and ask about his background and, and figure out if there's uh, logic to what he's saying. But skepticism and debunking are two different things. There's so much garbage and junk. There's so much backbiting and infighting and turf wars and debunking by UFO people. It's presumably people are interested in getting to the bottom of this who because a story comes from somebody else, they got to attack it. And it's just an amazing learning experience the last year or two since ATIP, OSAP, TTSA, all that stuff came out how vicious the, the field can be. It's debunking, it's not skepticism. So ask questions, be skeptical, but have an open mind and an open heart and be willing to learn stuff about it. What we've learned from Bob is, I, I think it's true. If it wasn't true, I wouldn't still be reporting about it 30 years later. This mystery seems to be tantalizingly out of our reach. You know, we learn a little bit more and it moves a little bit away. The goalpost seems to move a little bit. Uh, maybe it's leading us somewhere. Uh, maybe it's a learning curve, I hope so. But we don't know. And, uh, but it's an exciting time. I'm so glad for Bob that some of these other events have happened to sort of like take the burden off of him as being this lone nutball talking about flying saucer programs, <laughs> reverse engineering, uh, because uh, he hasn't deserved the, uh, the scorn and ridicule and, uh, you know, all the stuff that's come with it over the years. It's been, it's been a bitch. It's been a bitch. Yeah. Well, I just I want to end on one question for you, but I, I just want to say, you know, thank you, uh, Bob. Thank you, George, for letting me go on this ride with you. I, I, you know, I hope that um, we were able to bring things forward in a way that were logical for people to be able to consume. Thank you for letting me be a part of it. Uh, you guys, I know, have been in this war together for 30 years just trying to get to the truth. Kind of last question. What do you want the audience here in McMinnville, from your story, what, what is it you want people in the world to know from watching your film? What is it you, you're telling them? What do you want them to understand, very simply? It's just like I said in the movie. The events that I portrayed, everything that I said, happened exactly like I said it did. That's, that's all. The government really does have, or at least at that time, uh, had recovered alien craft, and they were spending a lot of time and money trying to figure out how they work and see if they could duplicate it. I have no idea where the project is now, but back then, that's what was going on, and that's what I did.